clean up miters and reinforce them. You know, it can be a little problematic. It really can. Um, we, here's a couple ways we do it. The first is when we can use a domino or a biscuit cutter and something this wide. I mean, we've got enough space here we could put a couple biscuits. I mean, a biscuit or a couple dominoes, and a couple, and a, and a biscuit meaning a number 20. Now, one of my tricks that I've used forever is to do what I call a wafer reinforcement. Now, I mean, you can actually mortise these. I mean, it, it's a ton of ways, but and a wafer, if you, look at this, this is what we have. Can you see up here in the corners? Now the way we accomplish this is the first thing we do is we simply glue the miter. Now let me explain. When you glue two end grains together, that is probably the weakest joint in woodworking. And one of the reasons is, is that again, the end grain is just gonna absorb the glue. Now this is maple, or birch rather, but if this was oak, or ash, where it's even more porous, it's going to go worse. So you want to do what's called size it. And, and again, sizing just simply means put a little glue on here and just take your finger and work it in. Rub it in real good. What you're doing with the glue is you're filling that end grain. You're filling it. You know, glues are designed to glue non-porous surfaces for the most part. Now I usually let that dry a little bit, but don't get a lot because you don't want to mess up your joint. Then apply some a bead of glue. Now here's a trick. Lay it end to end, take a good tape, do not go under, you just want to get the front of it. Let me turn this so you can see what I'm doing. Now you notice I've got the wax paper down, bring the tips right together, put the tape on. Now I'm going to tell you up front, you want a good tape. This tape is uh, all pro. And then you simply close the door. The tape is going to hold the, the corner. And it's going to make it pull. You see that? The issue then becomes the back. But what you can do, again, with a little bit of wax paper, span it, just get something across it, pull it up good and tight, and clamp it in place. And let the, let the joint dry. Once it's dry, now you can see on the back what I've got. I've got a good tight miter. Now, once it's dry, now again, I used a wafer, obviously, where it's not seen. Take a portioner bit in your drill press and drill a hole. Not all the way through. Just if you look right here, I went in only about half. Then, using the exact same bit, mark a piece of wood, then take your bandsaw and bandsaw that out. It doesn't have to be perfect. But the key to it is we got grain running this way, grain running this way. We want to take this and the wafer grain and run and, and go across it. 
that's going to give you a really nice tight joint. Now, to bandsaw it, the other key is always put the little hole from, from the portioner bit up, just like you see, because usually they sit proud, they sit high. But once it's dry, you can go back to the drill press and go down and, and flush them up. Works pretty fast, pretty easy. And I tell you what, I've never had one come apart, ever. Works really, really well. Now, the other thing I want to talk about while I'm here, we're talking about gluing things up and putting things together. I want to reemphasize again the biscuit joiner and the domino. The domino, I think, is probably a really good way to do a miter. And one of the reasons is, particularly if you've got one big enough, you can, is the domino makes such a decisive alignment point. And so when it goes together, it can't move and shift around on you. It's a whole lot easier to glue up. Okay? And the other thing, the domino, now a biscuit will, will handle alignment top and bottom, but the domino is going to control it, you know, forward and backward, so it just doesn't slip around. Uh, but they're pricey. Now, I want to talk a little bit about gluing up dovetails. One of the things you're going to want to do when you glue up dovetails is you want to glue the pin board, I mean the tail board, into the pin board. And that can be a little dicey. If you will make you, this is just a call, we use them constant. It's a glue call. And if you look at it, all it is, it looks like a sawtooth. And it's simply done by taking a band saw and running in, cutting out little notches. You want to cut the notches out so that they fit in between the dovetails that will allow the pin to push out, push through. Now, one of the things you also want to do, you notice there's tape all over this. You want to cover your call with some tape. If you don't, you wish you had. Because <laughs> it will definitely glue to the side of your whatever you're gluing up. Uh, it, you know, again, one of the things with a good dovetail joint, the biggest thing you're doing is you're pushing the, the glue out. You know, you're just getting the excess out because the dovetail is going to fit nice and tight. It works really well. All right. Um, I want to talk to you just a little bit about hinges, predominantly how to install them. But before I do, and I know I'm jumping around and I apologize, when we were talking about expansion and contraction, this is a backer board that was made for a dovetail jig, and you can see this crack in it. Now this is quarter saw and poplar, and this is a perfect example. This is a piece that's got a long grain and then vertical grain. So it's a complete cross grain lamination. And if you look, again, it's split. That shows you and I mean, this thing, is, this thing is a complete sandwich. It's all glued. This shows you just how strong wood movement can be. And if it wants to move, it's going to move. Now, one of the issues with this, what's wrong here? Well, this was two big boards glued on. One of the things that would have helped this would have been to have used narrower boards, glued them up, and then laminated it. The other thing is... This was probably done way too quick, meaning the wood came in and it just wasn't allowed to totally acclimate. But any, the wider the board, the more movement you're going to get. If you look at furniture store pieces, you're going to see a lot of thin strips glued up. They do that to help with expansion and contraction. The more glue joints, the less it moves. Just the way it works. But the other thing I wanted to bring to to light here and I don't think I mentioned it and I want to make sure I do is you know when you're attaching things no matter what it is and you're using screws one of the things you want to do is you want to elongate the hole
and just a simple rock back and forth so that this the wood has room to move a little bit goes a long way and even if you countersink this in the bottom that piece of wood can move very important and I think I mentioned, but if not, one of the things you're going to want is you want a good set of drill bits. And make, you know, one of my favorites is the, of course, the Fort, uh, I mean, the Brad Point. Get you a good set. And then, of course, like what I was just using is, is a split point bit. Okay. But what I want to talk about now is it, in my point to this is hinges. One of the dominant hinges that we use is in cabinetry or in high-end cabinetry, meaning furniture, is we use a butt hinge. Now the ones we prefer, we get from Horton Brass. One of the reasons is, is that, number one, I really like their finishes. The second thing is the accuracy of the hinges is just always perfect. Very, very well made. But installing one, a lot of people really get confused and have issues with this. Let me show you how to do it. All right, what we have to do is we have to make a mortise for the hinge. Now, what I have here, I've just got a little half inch height and half inch, it's just a little small pattern cutting bit. Now, what I want to do is I want to set this bit when the hinge is closed, if you look at it, it's on a slight taper this way. That's so that when it's actually installed, it comes up like this. That just so you got a little bit of room in there for your screws. And you want to make sure your screws are all the way down. So what you want to do, if you go to the barrel, which is the back part, and basically to understand this, whatever you have above the bit, or above the, how much hinge you have above that uh, router bit, that's gonna be your gap. Now, there's two ways of dealing with this. You can either mortise, let's assume we're doing a cabinet. You can mortise either the cabinet or the door or both. That's your choice. What I do is I typically just mortise the case. I don't mortise the door too, but you can. So this setup is for mortising just the case in this scenario, but I would have to go much less if I wanted to do the door and the case. The next thing, what you want to do is just simply take the hinge and set it on and just fold it over. Mark it with a knife. Now here's a little hint. As the door opens and closes, you don't want it super tight because it's actually going to when it closes, it's actually going to go down in that mortise a little bit. If you get super tight, that edge is going to catch, can catch a little bit. So once you've mortised it, kind of take a little file and rasp and angle it back. Dude. I'll show you. You just take a good dovetail saw. And cut it. Now the reason for this is the rotation of that bit can give you some chip out. You got to be careful with that. The cuts are going to prevent that. The other thing you're doing, the other thing that you're doing is you don't want to try to go with the router bit perfectly to the line. And you want a good see-through base, something you can see through well.
and that's where my chisel comes into play. I just got to clean off, clean up my end, and I'm good. Make sure your hinge is fitting in there nice and tight. Now, in this case, what I did is I went all the way through, meaning I have a little reveal here. You can, if you want, mortise that. It takes a lot longer, but you can. Now, what I'm trying to show you is right here where this little edge is, when the hinge closes, particularly once you get some finish on it, it can pinch just a little bit right there. So what you want to do is take a file or a rasp or something and just simply do a little teeny back angle on it. Just a little relief cut. And that's so that it can't catch on that corner. Now, when you're installing the hinge, one of the hard things is to be able to get centered into the hole for the screw. They make two kinds. There's one one is made by Snappy and the other one's made by called Vixbit, V I X. Um, I think the Snappy bits are a little better and they're simply a self-centering setup. Set your hinge in, fold it down tight and drill it. Now, if you're, you're using, here's a hint, if you're using brass screws, the other thing I think Horton does is they send you steel screws. Make sure you use the steel screw to get into the hole before you go using the brass. The other thing, you want a little beeswax, you want some type of a screw lubricant to keep from breaking those brass screws off. Take it easy with them. Now, once you've done that and the hinge is on, all you have to do is line it up with your door. Mark it. Then doing exact same thing just no more just just line it up and drill it. Screw it together you're good to go. Now, here's another tip. I rarely do all the holes that when I'm initially doing it. I usually just do the center, screw it together, and by doing that, if anything's a little bit whatever, I don't have hole repair. If you have, and I, I've told you, if you want to repair a screw hole, one of the best things in the world is a toothpick. If you've got a large one, get you a bamboo skewer. Works perfect. That's pretty much installing a hinge. Not difficult. All right, I want to talk a little bit with you about rasp and files. There's a ton of them, but in general, you're woodworking, I find there's two that I really, really like. Actually, three. Uh, there's a new kit on the block now that I've recently gotten, and I like them too. It's called the Cuts All. Uh, it's a nice rasp. And again, you just have to look at the coarseness and, you know, depending upon what you're doing. But my favorite, and they're not, and obviously, they're one of the most expensive, is the Aurora. A-U-R-O-I-A. -A. Aurora. E-U-R-I-O-U. -E sure as y'all can't spell. Now I got these, I've got several different grits um, for coarseness. This is a pretty heavy, aggressive one. And then there's a finer. Again, these came from Lee Valley. They are expensive. But I'm going to tell you what, these guys get the job done. 
if you're into doing a lot of heavy shaping like cabriolet legs and things, these guys are really nice to have. Because they will remove some wood. The other one is called an Iwasaki. I think Woodcraft is the only one who sells them. <clears throat> Again, they're pretty fast and they stay clean. I like that. Then here's the cut saw. The cut saw is a little bit more of a of like a coarse sandpaper type. It's like a um, I don't know whether ceramic or what it is, but they also cuts also makes the grinding burrs and things. I think it's a carbide, but it does nice. <clears throat> One of my all-time favorites is the Japanese saw rasp. If they make a handle goes on it. Just me being me, I don't have it on here, but it's, it actually just looks like a series of saw teeth. One of the things I like about it, particularly if I'm working on a mortise or something, where I need to clean up a little bit on a mortise, is that it doesn't have the teeth on the side. Meaning I can get in here and I'm going down. I'm not cutting into my edge. The Aurora is got the cut on the side. So if I get in here, I have to be careful of my edge. The same thing with the cut saw. Now, when you get to the Iwasaki's, it has an edge. So why do I have, it just depends upon what I'm doing, you know? And, but that's just kind of a quick, brief tour of RAS. And the little edge thing is something most guys don't think about. But again, depends upon what you're doing, it can make a difference. You don't want to be, rasping something and cutting into one side or the other. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about a drill press. You know, it's, drill press is kind of self-explanatory. The only thing I can really tell you is that whether you have a big unit like this or even a, a bench top, you want a good one. One of the things with a drill press is it's gonna give you a perfectly straight hole um, when you're drilling. And there's just so many applications where you need that. You know, like when we were talking about the mortises, you know, if you don't have a mortise or you don't have another means of doing it, you know, a drill press and, you know, punch out and then take a chisel and clean it up. Like I told you, I did that for many, many, many years. Works quite well. Um, you know, just anytime, anywhere, you want to drill something accurate. You know, the other thing is, you know, like back here behind us, here's the oscillating spindle sander, which I showed you. Um, you know, you can, get a, you can get a sanding drum that's right in your chuck. Use that. Did that for many years, too. You don't have to have all the big fancy. But if you're looking for a good drill press, a couple things you want to make sure. I prefer a variable speed. Now, this one has a keyless chuck. That's pretty nice, i got to say. But there's nothing wrong with one uses a key, and it's less money. Um, you want something, you know, you're going to see on, you know, you've got an adjustment here that you can adjust for depth, how deep you're going and whatever. This one's got a, this one's variable speed. Um, Variable speed, I think, personally, is probably more important if you're doing metal work than woodwork. Um, the, key to a, the key to a nice, clean anything is move the bit fast, turn, spin the bit fast, and move slow. That means that's that, you know, not too slow, you get burned in wood. But the, the faster the bit's turning, but in many cases, these large bits and different things, you really need to slow the speed down. So if it's got a variable speed, that's nice. Is it an absolute necessity? Some would, could probably argue against my feelings, but I don't think, I, you know, it's really nice to have. But, you know, again, if you can afford it, get it. If you can't, you know, just a nice little drill press. I mean, you can pick them up relatively inexpensive. 
Uh, the bench tops, they work fine. They're not going to, you know, and I mean, again, you're not, it's not a tool that has to have a tremendous amount of power, you know, again, depending upon what you're doing. But, you know, this one, this one we've got, you know, will slide out to give us a bigger work surface. But for years, I just took and put, I mounted a piece of plywood to my uh, platform here, made it bigger. Um, they're nice. You know, sanding, it's everybody's nemesis. Everybody hates to sand. Rightfully so. It's tough. But there's things that make a huge difference. One is the quality of the sander. The other is the quality of the sandpaper. Now, I've mentioned to you in different things what we're called, we are ha we have a term we call construction sanding. That's where we're shaping. That's where we're working out a shape. Like we talked about sanding the ends of a dovetail, a dovetail drawer smooth. That's again where you want to use a little coarser sandpaper. Coarse in my world is usually an 80 or 120. Um, and of course, the lower the number, the more aggressive or the coarser the grit. There's two sandpapers I'm pretty fond of. One is the Merca Abernet. It looks like a screen. Um, all right, this is the Abernet. The Abernet is kind of like a screen. Can we see this? Uh, dust collection on it is excellent. And that's just because, again, it's like a screen. It's very, very aggressive cut. It does a really nice job. The only caution I will give you on the Abernet is that it's a zirconia grit, which means it wears well and it's, it's a really sharp cut. Um, if you would normally finish sanding at about 180 on the Abernet, you want to jump up to 220. It's just a little bit more aggressive than the normal aluminum oxide sandpaper. The others that we use, might, well, we get all of our abrasives with noted exception to the Abernet from a company called Industrial Abrasives. And the product that we like is the Rhino brand. Now this says white line, they sell two, two. One's a red line, one's a white line. The white line is the little bit more industrial grade and it does a really, really nice job. Now this is, of course, a hook and loop. They make a PSA, which stands for pressure sensitive adhesive, but it's good, it's good stuff. All right, let's talk a little bit about sanders. You know, for years we used a little electric sander we used the Porter Cable model typically, and we've used the Bosch and all of them, just a little electric. And they do just fine. I, I'm not going to tell you they don't. They do. Uh, relatively inexpensive compared to higher end. Then later we went to using air sanders. Uh, but you got to have a big compressor and everything like that to run them. One of the things with air sanders, they're air hogs. They pull a lot of air. So you got to have a big, you, you got to have at least a three horsepower, you know, 30 gallon tank to handle. And even then you might have to stop and wait a little bit, but they do nice. Um, and they, they wear forever. But I'm, I'm going to be real honest with you. One of the things with those in years of using them, they're pretty tough on your wrist and hands because not the air sanders, but the, bit, the bigger electric. The lower profile sanders you get, the better. Now, typically we used a five inch pad. Uh, they do fine. Um, I like to have a five and a six. The six inch is better for larger surfaces. But of late, the sanders that we've been using are the Merca line. And Merca was the ones we used in our air sander. There's, there's, a, there's several out, there's numerous out there, but the Merca sanders, we've just run, run them to death. 
and they just keep going. I mean, they've really held up well. Uh, then Merker came out with one they call the Ceros, C-E-R-O-S. And the Ceros looks just like an air sander, except it's electric. Now, it has a transformer with it, but one of the things with it is is the hand. It's very, very comfortable on the hand. You can use it one-handed. Uh, it's, it's got an excellent, excellent dust collection on it. You can need a dust extractor with it, or you can rig it up with a shop vac. Then, just recently, they came out with what's called a Deros, D-E-R-O-S. The Deros doesn't have the transformer. It's a little bit different. It's got a little longer handle. But again, the ergonomics of it are the same. Um, they're quite powerful. They do a really good job. They have variable speed and so forth, so on. Now you can hear when I turn that on, you hear in the background uh, the vacuum come on. You, if you, when you buy a dust extractor, and if you have a Festool, I think it'll work with this. I'm not sure. Uh, but one of the things, that's really nice to have the vacuum come on. But then again, flip, flip a switch and go to the sand and turn it off. It's not a, it's not a huge deal. The other little guy that we use a lot because we do a lot of, again, furniture corners, is the little triangle-shaped detail sanders. Um, they do a nice job. Now, this is one made by Fiend, or Fine. We call it a Fiend because it's a sanding Fiend. They really do good. But I'm going to be honest with you. You know, if it's not something you use a lot, uh, believe it or not, this is one came from Harbor Freight. And... It's done pretty good. Is it as smooth and as comfortable as the fine? No. But again, depending if you're a hobby guy, depending upon what you're doing, would it do? Yeah, it would. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, sanding is very important. The main thing I wanted to touch base with is what we're talking about construction sanding is that think ahead. When you're building something and you've got a case and you've got a side coming down and you've got another one coming into it, if you assemble that, sanding in there is going to be extremely difficult. And if you start running the edge of your sander up into the edges, you're going to cut a groove. That's where you want to pre-sand. You want to sand all of that so that you don't have to deal with it after assembly. Think about that. We have a little cliche, okay, it says build to finish. That's the reason we don't put box in things. We try to build where we don't have box in them. We don't have drawer bottoms. We don't want things encapsulated. Of course, then again, we spray most of our finishes and that's a little bit more problematic than if you can brush in a corner actually easier than you can spray in a corner because the spray does a thing called bounce back and it just kind of, the overspray kind of hits and just kind of bounces back. So all of that said to say, you know, there's th just think about what you're doing, your access and how you're going to do things. And sanding, and again, the high-end sanders, they're not cheap. They'll, they're not cheap at all. But they do a nice job. But any of them sand good, you know, pretty much. Just get a good one. Okay. You know, when I sit out to do this DVD, um, as you saw, it was me trying to show you how I do things and the way we've done them around here. My objective on it was to try to do about a two DVD series highlighting how we do things and the products and what we use. The purpose of the DVD, again, was to give you an understanding of what we do, how we do it, and what with. I think we're probably now into four or five discs. I'm way behind on it. I'm really bad about that, is that I start something like this and I'm kind of going to, and it's not that I don't stay focused, I don't think, it's that there's just so much to it. 
But in this DVD, the best we can do was to hit the highlights and, and the top of the points. You can go to our website at cn-woodworking.com. Uh, we've got a ton of videos that we've done. We have an online class that we do. We have an online finishing class. But again, this, this DVD was kind of aimed at the new guys and people wanting to get started. Uh, by no means are we going to tell you the way we do it is the only way to do it or the products that we use are the only products you should use. We're just going to, we just told you what we use and that it works for us. The, what we've shown you is procedures, techniques, and products that have proven themselves over 40, 40 some odd years. So, you know, that was the basis of this. Uh, like I told you in the beginning, the number of products that I have gotten and thrown away and had fail, oh, you just have no idea. But hopefully this will give you an idea uh, of places, you know, and products to look at. Um, that was the purpose. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I know I forgot something. I hope not, but I know I did, but it'll be okay. Be safe. That's the big key. And woodworking should be enjoyed, and to do that, you have to be safe. Remember what I told you early on. If you're trying to do something and it doesn't feel safe to you, it's not. Safety is between your ears. Again, common sense, and if it doesn't feel safe to you or you're scared of doing it, don't. Find an alternative. I'm Charles Neal. Catch you later.